topic of tonight's presentation is actually economic uh, impacts of gas drilling, which will be very ably covered by my co-panelist, Dr. Barth. Um, and so the question was, uh, how do I warm up the audience for her? And um, I decided that I should talk to you about my favorite myths about gas drilling. Um, and I say that because I think all of the myths, um, all of the myths actually um, impact economic impacts as well. And I think each one of these um, is something I have studied a long time, and I'd like to delve into um, the realities. So the things I'm going to talk about are, um, are five. Sorry, I think I told you it's going to be my first presentation with a PowerPoint, so it's not going to be perfect. Um, I'm going to talk about the claim or the PR statement or the sales pitch, which, by the way, there's no doubt the gas drilling industry is here in our region trying to sell us on their efficacy, on their moral integrity, on their technology, and on why it is we should, in effect, sell our land to them and turn over our lifestyle to them. Um, so this, this is the sales pitch, and these are my five favorite points of it. One is that um, there should be no reason we shouldn't jump to this opportunity because no incidents of contamination have ever been attributed to horizontal or vertical hydrofracking, for that matter. No incidents whatsoever. Secondly, we don't have to worry about any of this because our government will protect us. Our DEC, our EPA, we're, they're on the job and we don't have anything to worry about. Next, we frequently hear the technology is so advanced now, we have nothing to worry about. Um, the technology in itself is so complex, no human being could fully understand it, but nevertheless, you can count on the fact that it will remediate any problems, it will treat all the wastewater, and it will make sure that nothing dangerous happens. Next, there's a notion that domestic gas production and gas extraction of this kind is somehow a patriotic duty, that if we love our country, we will try to protect it from foreign sources of energy which are trying to destroy us, so that we should be all the more willing to engage in these practices and turn these processes on in our communities as a patriotic duty. And lastly, um, one of my favorites, by the way, you can't do anything about it anyway. You're all powerless because all of these matters have been preempted. Um, the state is actually in charge and you are not. And I think that is the last uh, myth um, that I will address and it's one of the most uh, misleading and the most troubling to me because I know it isn't true and I'm gonna report to you from um, a neighboring county, Otsego County, about the many ways in which we are making a difference. Let's talk about the claim that no incidents of contamination um, have ever been shown. I first heard this claim early on in my getting familiar with the draft supplemental generic environmental impact statement. As a lawyer, I'm particularly driven to evidence. So I wanted to examine this claim especially because it sounded so um, dramatic to me. How could it be that there's no claim ever of a contamination related to fracturing. And this wasn't just said by the gas industry, I've got to explain. Um, this was actually said by our then DEC Commissioner, Pete Granis. It was also included in the draft supplemental generic environmental statement itself. And so I promptly went to the section of the draft where this was claimed, and there it was, no incidents. And I went to Appendix 15, which was the support for this statement. Appendix 15 is there for all of you to see. It's in your draft. Appendix 15 contains letters and quotes from, coincidentally, 15 gas drilling commissioners of 15 different states where fracturing is already in practice. And so these states include Ohio and Pennsylvania and New Mexico and so forth. And I read their letters and I read their quotes. And it became immediately apparent to me that they were all using the same language. They were all saying nothing could be attributed to horizontal drilling. I'm sorry, to horizontal fracturing or fracturing. Nothing could be claimed to be caused by fracturing. Nothing could be documented to be caused by fracturing. And then in the very letters that are attached to Exhibit 15 are 
admissions that in fact there are hundreds of complaints. In fact, these states, all of these states, have experienced repeated rounds of claims of contamination, but they're not attributed to fracturing. Guess what they're attributed to? And these are quotes. They're attributed to improper drilling through aquifers, um, casing failure, operator error, uh, equipment failure, uh, blowouts, unexpected blowouts, explosions, but not fracturing. So I realized that there is a sophisticated word game being played with the population, which is that for some purposes, we define fracturing as the whole process, the life cycle, if you will, of getting the fresh water, mixing it with chemicals, injecting it, and so forth. But for the purpose of claiming that no one has ever attributed contamination to fracturing, they were limiting the definition of the word fracturing to that period of time when the wells are actually under pressure. Well, I suggest to you that that is actually a fraud on the public. I think this is one of the greatest defects in the draft generic environmental impact statement. I think it is misleading the public. I think anybody would agree if this were in uh, securities filing, this would be fraud. So this is something I hope that our state will correct. And it's something you need to be aware of when you hear that particular sales pitch. I'm going to cover the EPA in the next section. Um, but a related aspect of this sales pitch, the one that says, there are no problems here. There, there never have been. How could there be? We wouldn't allow it. Um, the related claim is that, of course, fracturing has been done in New York for decades, maybe multiple decades. We've always been fracturing in New York, and we don't have any problems in New York related to fracturing. Well, I regret to say that that, too, is not true when you look behind the statement and you look at the evidence. Um, uh, Walter Hang of Toxics Targeting has developed a long list of substantial contaminations in New York State as a result of vertical fracturing. Over 260 examples from the DEC's own files. And in almost every instance for remediation, the DE says no action taken. Because no action could be taken. I mean, these are occurring, this is occurring deep below the Earth's surface. The technology for remediation didn't exactly exist, and the DEC wasn't staffed to perform it. So um, the fact that there has been no problem in New York State is simply not true. Check your facts if you hear this claim again. Um, we also sometimes hear about um, the 1992 GEIS and the fact that it has protected New York so well. But of course, the 1992 GEIS, under which current vertical wells are drilled, was issued mm, almost 20 years ago, based on evidence presented that was 25 to 30 years old. It was long before these kind of chemicals were being injected. Um, in any ground in New York State or anywhere else. It was long before um, horizontal, uh, horizontal hydraulic fracturing was really applied in tight shale formations. So the fact that it's been done in New York it doesn't give us much consolation at the moment. So I want to move next to um, the fact that when you're confronted by the claim that there have been no incidents of contamination, all we have to do really is look to our neighboring states um, in Pennsylvania, Cabot Oil has been um, found guilty of violations with respect to approximately 50% of their wells. The problems in Dimmick and elsewhere in Pennsylvania are, are fairly well known now. We at Otsego 2000 early on did a summary of press reports about problems in various communities. It's on our website. Um, these are the communities we happen to study and there's a summary there. Uh, Riverkeeper has done an amazing study called Fractured Communities. It's on the Riverkeeper website, which lists all of the blowouts, the spills, the migrations, and so forth. It's really an amazing um, work product. Uh, and here's the Toxics Targeting website, which I've already referred to. So let me turn to the next myth that is often said, and that is that our government will protect us. And of course, um, we don't apparently see the news, so apparently we don't know that our government is bankrupt. <laughs> um, our New York state government is bankrupt, many other state governments are bankrupt, and our federal government is largely bankrupt. Uh, New York state uh, 
has to do something about it because they can't print money or borrow, uh, the federal government isn't so constrained, so they're limping along. But um, the truth is that um, we really cannot rely on our government. And I'm sorry to say that, I wish it weren't true, but I think most of us know that whether it's the post office or public education, or dare I say social security or Medicare, often the government disappoints. Often their funds are cut. Often they're understaffed. So to simply assume that in this one instance the government will protect us is somewhat foolhardy. Um, in fact, the fact that uh, DEC is understaffed and underfunded was back in October very visibly disclosed by our then chairman or uh, commissioner of the DEC, Pete Granis. He issued a memo, um, which he thought would remain internal, indicating that if the public were aware of the lack of funding at the DEC and the risks that it is, is posing to the environment, we would be shocked. Uh, instead of repairing this problem, our governor chose to fire Mr. Granis, which I guess at the time seemed like a good idea. Uh, in any event, uh, I don't think there's any doubt that we can't rely on our DEC. Um, with respect to the federal government, you know, there are rampant calls now for entirely dismantling our EPA. Um, so who will protect us if the state government is impaired, and if, if some people have their way, the budget of the EPA is completely cut. And then let's talk about the EPA for a minute. The EPA um, issued a report which, again, as part of the myth that the government will protect us, is often cited as proof that hydrofracking is safe. This is a report that the EPA prepared in 2004. An EPA whistleblower, um, Mr. Weston Wilson, a bit of a mouthful, um, actually called the EPA on this and said that this um, report was scientifically unsound. You should know that in rendering this report, the EPA never tested anything scientifically. You know what they did? They relied on those same kinds of declarations that I quoted that were attached to the draft generic environmental impact statement. They relied on statements from mining commissioners who said there have been no incidents attributed to fracturing contaminations. And the EPA was at that point looking only at coal bed mining and methane extraction where the methane is located in coal beds. And so the EPA in 2004, in its wisdom, concluded that, well, coal mining is by and of itself fairly dangerous. It by and of itself leads to contamination. It by and of itself contaminates the air and the land and some water sources. So can you prove that fracturing added anything to this? No, you can't. How can you prove that just the moment when those beds were fractured is when the release of harmful contaminants occurred. So the EPA, back in 2004, concluded, based on this, there's no reason to go through a more detailed study. This was a phase one study. They never proceeded to phase two or three or four. They just concluded, based on this, there's no probability that fracturing is the cause of the contamination, pressurized fracturing. Um, what happened next is that, this was 2004, Halliburton had invented the technique for hydraulic fracturing and supplies most of the chemicals, or at that time supplied a lot of the chemicals used in the process. Halliburton took the new EPA report state straight to the Congress, and on the basis of this substantially flawed EPA report, there was an amendment to the 2005 Energy Act which was passed through the Bush administration and through the American Congress and legislature at the time, which exempted the oil and gas industry from the Safe Drinking Water Act prohibitions for injection of contaminants. It's the only industry that has that uh, exemption. If any one of you were going to drill a water well or anything else, you would be subject to all those um, restrictions, but not the oil and gas industry. So again, 
Uh, you just wonder, why are we so safe? Why are we so sure the government will protect us when they have already shown that they have, are willing to exempt one industry from precisely the law that might provide some protection? There's a great article that I like to cite, and I cite it here. It's in our materials, especially our EPA submission. I'm sorry, ATSIGO 2000 submission to the EPA in connection with the scope of their new hydraulic fracturing study. It's written by um, Professor Hannah Wiseman. It's titled Untested Waters. It appeared in the Fordham um, Law Review. And she takes you through in painstaking, and believe me, it is painstaking because I've read the article more than once. But if anyone is curious about exactly how the EPA study was handled, how it was done, and um, how the exemption from the Safe Drinking Water Act was achieved, it is all laid out in this very detailed law review article. And again, I think we're all here tonight because we want to know the facts. So I feel like my job is to help you find the facts for yourself. Go and read them. Don't believe the hype. Don't believe the emotion. Don't believe the sales pitch. Don't believe the fear mongering. Read the facts. And I think we can all discuss this more rationally um, if we have. So the, the slightly good news is, before the EPA gets defunded, that um, they might actually perform a study of the life cycle of hydraulic fracturing. And they're well on their way. I mean, they've appointed their scientific panel. They have um, identified now, in general terms, their scope. They've also identified, just this week, I believe, at least I just saw it this week, they've identified the, um, the sites that they may focus on in their study, and it includes three Marcellus, Whale, Marcellus Shale sites, including Bradford County in Pennsylvania. Um, I'm just looking through my notes to see if I have that, those sites written down. Uh, yes, I do. So it's Bradford and Susquehanna, Pennsylvania, counties Pennsylvania, Green and Washington County in Pennsylvania, and Wetzel County in West Virginia. There's also sites in Colorado, Texas, and North Dakota that they will be doing um, an in-depth retrospective analysis of all aspects of water, potential water contamination. Lastly, when, when someone tells you that um, our government will protect us, I'd like to point to this. Our government has tried to protect us. Um, every agency in New York State that has any power over environmental regulation has commented on the draft GEIS and has urged New York State to stop, to proceed cautiously, to do cumulative impact studies, and to not allow the practices set forth in the original draft GEIS to go forward. And it's interesting, I include here, you know, some pretty heavy hitters. The new EPA, the New York State Public Employees Federation Steward Council. Now you may wonder, like, why am I citing to this union? You know who those guys are? They're DEC employees. The DEC Employees Union actually find, filed comments opposing the then commissioner's draft. I think that's quite remarkable in terms of you know, the hopefulness that there is about public education and people's courage in speaking out. We also have the Watershed Inspector General for the New York City Watershed. Um, then the titular head of that was um, Andrew Cuomo. Um, we have the New York City Department of Environmental Protection, very strong comments. They hired the best engineering firm in the country, Hazen and Sawyer. All this is available on multiple websites, but certainly on the Atsigo 2000 website. Um, the then New York State Senate Environmental Conservation Committee Chair, Antoine Thompson, the New York State Conference of Environmental Health Directors, and there's been a lot of progress even beyond this made on health professionals stepping up and putting pressure on the Department of Health to take a strong role in being a full um, interested party for secret purposes in connection with the effects on public health. And I think progress is being made. And then my own county, Soil and Water Conservation District, and that's Eagle Lake Water Supervisory Commission, all filed comments saying this is dangerous. Why would all these agencies do that if it weren't something we should be considering carefully? Take a look at their comments if you haven't already done so. Another um, 
claim that is often made is trust the technology. And um, I go back and forth on this one. I, I would love to trust the technology. Often I do, but often it totally malfunctions. And it took us an hour just to set up this PowerPoint. Uh, so while the technology may be better than it's been, it isn't there yet. One of the principal problems with the technology in New York State, this is right up there for me at least with, um, with the claim that there have been no contaminations attributed to hydraulic fracturing, is the claim that the wastewater products, the fracking fluids that come back up and the heavy brine and chemicals that are part of deep within the Earth's surface and come up um, with the fracking fluids, that these, that these fluids can be disposed of rationally, properly, and safe, safely. So I investigated this too. I, I, I started looking at where do they send fracking flowback fluid. Um, well, you might already know, or you might be surprised to know, that in New York State, do you know where they have historically put fracking fluid? Right on our roads. They use it for de-icing, because it's fairly briny, so it's salty. And they use it um, for dust control. So all this material with chemicals, with potentially radioactive waste, has been spread on our roads. Um, now, you know, I've, I've got to say that the vertical wells so far are not drilled as deeply as the tight shale wells will be. And Maybe there's less radiation in them, but I don't know that anyone has ever checked. That's where they have been put. They have been a cheap source of highway maintenance for us. Um, the other place that people like to put the wastewater also gives me concern. What they like to do is inject it back into the soil someplace else. They take it out of one hole to get the gas out, and then they have all this flowback water, so they have injection wells. It works pretty well in Texas, which is not as heavily populated, is very dry, and um, is further removed from water sources such as we have, lakes and streams. But in New York City, I'm sorry, in New York State, it doesn't work at all. We only have four injection wells in New York State, and they're pretty well filled up. So that means the millions of gallons of fracturing fluid and flowback fluid that would be generated by this process, they all have to be trucked somewhere. They have to be dumped somewhere else. And now I'm coming to a, a real serious problem. Sometimes people say, well, they're going to be delivered to municipally and privately owned wastewater treatment plants. And the first time I heard that, I thought, well, at least that one sounds good. You know, a wastewater treatment plant, surely they can treat these wastes. Well, I delved into that, and the news isn't good there either. The municipal and privately owned treatment plants that exist in New York State are mainly there to take out solids in the flow back or in the liquids. They do not and cannot take out dissolved chemicals. They do nothing to protect our drinking water supplies. What they do with these flowback fluids is simply dilute them further to reduce their concentrations and put them back into the wastewater streams, which are our rivers. The Susquehanna River, um, Cooperstown, is the headwaters of the Susquehanna River. Lake Otsego is the source of the Susquehanna River that meanders for miles and serves millions of people. And our DEC and the gas drilling industry proposes to simply dilute and dump fracking fluids right into that water. I'm very troubled by that, as I guess is clear. Um, let me go through a couple of slides. Oh, these are some of the fracking chemicals that are found in the water. Um, this, is, this is a picture of one of the gas tem wells in Otsego County, interestingly. And, um, you know, it, it sort of looks troubling, but this is a vertical well that was actually fracked with nitrogen, so very little flowback water was produced. It still took them about a year to figure out where to send the waste. Nobody knew where to send this waste. Watertown at first agreed to take it, then decided they couldn't take it. 
Um, and the trucks were loaded up and then sent back and forth. It was a huge problem. But this is what a water treatment system might look like for a horizontal well. This is a picture from Pennsylvania. Massively greater quantities of water. All those yellow containers contained fracking fluids that would, will need to find a home, which New York doesn't have a home for them. They're going to be, I guess, trucked back and forth on trucks to who knows where. Another article that I highly commend to you was written by David Carbo. He's a scientist with Region 3 um, of EPA. It's a long article. I had to choose one sentence for my little slide. But um, he concludes that um, there's a serious risk of destruction of aquifers as a result of the fracturing process. This is an EPA, current EPA scientist who wrote uh, a paper. And lastly, if it's so safe, and if the state initially was happy to propose a generic environmental impact statement that covered everybody, it was going to apply to New York City and Syracuse from, you know, from point to point in New York State. How come in April of 2010, suddenly the DEC had a change of heart? Suddenly, a press release was issued oh, well, we didn't really mean it for New York City. Um, and we didn't mean it for Syracuse. And first of all, this was presented for public comment and hearing on the grounds that it would be a one rule applies to all. Suddenly, the game was dramatically changed. This was obviously done for political reasons. But let me just also say that I think this violates equal protection and is, in effect, immoral. And I am sorry, but there is no other way to describe a system or an industry or a government that would decide that the health of children in New York City is deserving of more protection than the health of our own children. There is no way you can convince me that if it's not safe for New York City, it's safe for my home. And I believe upstate will fight this. I know there are people who are desperate for financial gain from this process. But if the financial gain must be won, then let's at least have one rule that applies to everybody. Because if you think you're going to poison the New York City water supply, you might just poison ours. So um, I think we're going to fight very hard for one rule of law applying to all citizens of New York. You have my personal commitment on that. And let me just back up to say that um, the basis for the claim that New York City and Syracuse should be treated specially, maybe I should back up one more step. Lawyers will agree that sometimes different kinds of laws are made for different groups. There has to be a rational basis for the discrimination. Rational means some scientific reason. So they tried to come up with a rational basis for this insidious discrimination. And the basis they, they came up with was, well, you know, New York and Syracuse, they have an unfiltered water system. They have a filtration avoidance device, and that's why they need special protection. Well, first of all, as most people on a private well know, they don't have a filtration device either, or if so, it's a very small one. But beyond that, that implies that someone that does have a filtration system, like Cooperstown, has a small, privately, um, municipally owned water treatment facility, that implies that the water can be treated and made safe. But I think we just discussed dissolved chemicals of these kinds. And this will include the radium that was described, and all of the heavy metals, and even benzene, because they're still allowing drilling with benzene. So all of those materials are not filtered out by a municipally owned treatment facility. So if these chemicals get into Lake Otsego, and I know you have your own beautiful lake here, and you have your own concerns about that, but the, we share those concerns, there is no treatment plant that will get them out. So why shouldn't we be treated the same as New York? The problem that we are facing can't be cured by a treatment plant. I believe the courts will accept that. I believe they will see that that is not a rational basis for a discrimination because our treatment plants don't get the chemicals out. I love this one. Local gas production is our patriotic duty. 
So I went and investigated that too. And my first thought was, well, is it going to be used domestically? Can we be sure of that? Will it stay in New York State? Nope. Won't stay in New York State. In fact, Norse, that had an agreement to supply farmers gas from the wells on their property, just broke that agreement. I mean, it won't even stay if it's coming out of the hole in your backyard. Uh, but it won't stay in New York State. And guess what? It may not even stay in our country. Uh, Chesapeake has just signed a memor memorandum of understanding to build two uh, liquefied natural gas export facilities, one in British Columbia, one in Louisiana. And you know, there isn't any doubt that the export of natural gas, if it can be extracted cheaply and dirtily here in the Marcellus Shale, will proceed. Because these gas drilling companies, guess what? They're not domestic either. I mean, they have some pretty nice names, like Chesapeake and Eagle. But I went and took a look at who owns Chesapeake and Eagle. And so it turns out that Chesapeake um, is owned 33% by the Chinese, a company called CNOOC, CNOOC, or maybe there's some other pronunciation. 33% of Chesapeake, no wonder they're building a gas export um, plant or two. And the rest of Chesapeake, well, 33% as of 2008 was owned by a company called Stat Oil, which is Norwegian. I mean, do the math, that's like almost 70%, and I didn't even delve into the last 30%. Um, they just sold their Arkansas operations to another foreign company called BHP Billiton from Australia. So, so much for our domestic pride that we're going to help our domestic industries and jobs. Um, Cabot, major shareholder in Cabot, Schlumberger. They're not a domestic company. They're Dutch. They're a big multinational company. India, India has invested heavily in Marcel Lachelle, three billion dollars. 1.7 million was spent to acquire Carriza and Arista, and 1.3 to acquire Eagle Ford. They sound local, but they're not. So, um, I mean, I suppose you know Gastem is Canadian, um, Norse is Norwegian. Um, this is another myth. This is another attempt to sell you a product, pulling on what I consider an emotional heartstring. Help your country. Make the sacrifice. Don't be a NIMBY. We are becoming a dumping ground for the sake of our Chinese owners. That troubles me. The last um, entry on that slide was what's happening in Pennsylvania. Um, this is the start of the installation of a well pad in Dimmick. This is an image of um, the pumps, the supplies, and so forth for a horizontal site. They want to put one of these every square mile. Every square mile. The Bradford County um, head of environmental conservation named Mike Lovegren spoke in Cooperstown. He was an invitee of our soil and water conservation um, representative, Scott Fickbaum. And he had some very interesting reports from Bradford County, which as you know is in northern Pennsylvania. First of all, 85 to 90 percent of the land in Bradford County is now leased. There is no opposition anymore in Bradford County. They have all either left or gone to work for the gas companies. He described that there's been a major personnel drain from all county offices. He, he lost five people in the last 18 months from the Department of Environmental Conservation. Uh, it may be that I've got the name of his department a little bit wrong, but it's um, Mike Lovegren, and he could be Soil and Water for Bradford County. And Teresa's nodding, yes, I, sorry. So it's Soil and Water Committee for Bradford County. He lost five people in the last, he can't compete with the salaries. Their police, all gone to work for security forces. They can't compete with the salaries. Um, there's no severance tax in Pennsylvania. There's no severance tax in New York. County has no money to regulate this process. He said yesterday, 
2,500 emergency calls per week now in Bradford County. The population of Bradford County has doubled in three years, doubled. And the people that are coming in have no particular ties to the community. They don't have a social support system. They're sometimes transient, sometimes families that have moved a lot, and they bring social problems that the county cannot respond to. He said traffic is very, very difficult, very congested, that their accident rates are off the charts. He also said that the drilling, he is now being told, will continue at least 50 years, and he said he has heard as long as 100 years. So those people who left aren't coming back anytime soon. Um, he said that what they're doing now, in addition to the well pads, they are installing hundreds of miles of pipelines, both to carry away the gas, but now they've decided that they could put in pipelines to carry fresh water to the sites. So they're establishing large, large reservoirs on mountaintops and just bringing pipes down to every well pad of fresh water. Um, obviously, it's fragmenting their agricultural land, it's fragmenting their forest land. Here's an interesting thing he told us. Chesapeake uh, made a decision to test most of the wells. In fact, I think they made a decision to test all of the wells within 2,500 feet of where they operate. So far, they have tested 10% of the wells. And so far, they have discovered that 25% of the wells have signs of methane migration, and 30% do not meet federal drinking water standards. It's a pretty um, bad start for their first 10% of testing. Now, he did say that um, rentals are up, restaurant business is up, so there's maybe a little bit of trickle in from the sales tax. Home rentals are up because some of the people that are coming in need housing. He said it has had the effect of greatly increasing rents, so that these are his words. Anyone on a fixed income has had to leave. They couldn't afford the rents. Their landlords were saying, I'm sorry, but I could rent for three times what you've been paying me for 20 years. Please move. Um, he also, um, you know, he, he admitted that now the gas companies are his constituents. And I felt such a sadness that he's been there for 31 years and it has come to that. Um, that county has been transformed. I don't think anyone would want to live in Bradford County now unless they were just planning to make quick bucks and get out of town. I know that you have just recently heard uh, the impressive presentations by um, Helen Slotchy and Mary Jo Long. I'm not in any way going to repeat any of that, but let me just say that for a very long time in this state, we have been told, so sorry, you need not apply, you need not worry, it is all being taken care of, the local governments can do nothing except road use and property taxes, that's it. Well, this too is proving false, as you know from Helen and Mary Jo's presentations. Uh, in fact, the closest parallel to the attempted preemption that the DEC has instituted here is the mine land reclamation law, and under that law, cases have held that outright prohibition of certain heavy industry is permissible in New York State, and also ordinances of general applicability will be enforceable against the gas drilling companies. I mean, I guess they haven't been exempted from every law yet. Um, or let's hope not. So anyway, um, there is some hope that local towns um, can make a difference. Let me just add that another reason why I think the preemption argument will collapse eventually of its own weight is that the DEC itself in its draft generic environmental impact statement never claimed total field preemption. They never attempted to regulate every aspect of gas drilling. In fact, they said that the drilling companies need to go to the local municipalities for things like agriculture district protections, floodplain protections, sensitive site protections, of course road use, historic site protections. Nowhere in the document does it say, we are it. It says you go and you negotiate with the local municipalities. That doesn't sound like complete intentional field preemption. And by the way, if they did try field preemption, they would have had to pass the law twice 
in two different legislatures, and they didn't do that. Because home rule in New York isn't just a statute, it's a constitutional right. And the legislature knew they couldn't trust each other. They knew that, you know, some legislature might be convinced to pass a law that implicates home rule or impairs it. So they said, no, 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 you're not going to get away with that. You're going to have to pass it again in the next legislature. So uh, a lot remains to be done. But meanwhile, I can tell you, at least in Otsego County, as one of our town supervisors said, we are not afraid anymore. We are organizing on every level through every town in our county. First of all, um, Otsego 2000, with the other groups um, listed here, have formed a very active, very hardworking coalition. Um, some of the members of that coalition are here tonight. Teresa is here from Butternuts. Um, these are not small groups. These groups each represent hundreds, if not thousands, of potential voters. And guess what? We are beginning to get traction. One of our biggest successes has been the beginnings of a business recognition of the problems. And Omegong Brewery has done an amazing job in Otsego County leading the way on this effort. They took it upon themselves to issue a very, very broad, well-written press release um, opposing hy hydraulic fracturing. It even got a publication, um, publicity in Europe because they're a European company. Um, they then contacted all of the businesses in the county. They have started to generate a list, and you can see it there, 200 businesses petitioned to halt fracking here. Um, this was last week's Freeman's Journal headline. I'm very proud of this one. I'm holding on to that. Um, they went and met with the Cooperstown Village Chamber of Commerce, and the Village Chamber of Commerce said, yeah, you know, you may have a point. We're a little bit worried about tourism and museums and Glimmer Glass Opera and bed and breakfast. Let's poll our members. 85% of the Cooperstown Chamber of Commerce members wrote back saying, we don't want this in our community. So the Cooperstown Chamber of Commerce has come out against hydraulic fracturing. And the list of businesses is growing. Um, this momentum is building. Um, just this week, the Board of Trustees of Bassett Hospital came out seeking a cumulative impact study and wait for the EPA. This was a huge, huge achievement because this is one of the leading employers in our county and they will carry some weight. Um, they will even carry some weight, we hope, with the new Department of Health Commissioner who I hear, Dr. Um, Shaw, is a very impressive individual. In addition to the work of our business community and the work of our environmental and neighborhood groups, we have now, as I think I might have just mentioned, established small committees in every single town in our county. And these committees are hardworking. They have, in some towns like Middlefield and Otsego, they have already done blanket telephone campaigns where they've called every household. They have sent out flyers. That's an example of, you know, a kind of flyer that they've sent out. They have drafted petitions addressed to their town board representatives demanding action. And I've got to tell you, and Barb Monroe is here, this movement is led by young families, the mothers of young children in our county. And when I was in Albany one time, one of the legislators told me, he said, you know what, you can fight anybody, but you can't fight young women who are fighting for their children. And when the young women of Cherry Valley or Middlefield, with their children in tow, show up at those board meetings, and when they're told, I'm so sorry, we can't do anything, unless it's road use, we really can't touch it, they have demanded action and they've gotten it. Because you can't say no to a mother holding a baby, ultimately. Um, so we've discovered that power, and Barb Monroe is a good representation of that. Thank you for being here. Um, we've also um, begun drafting land use regulations in, I would say, 
a good third of our towns now have some either land use regulations in place or land use regulations on their way, which will ban um, which will ban heavy industry such as hydraulic fracturing. We have written numerous letters to the editor. There probably isn't a week that goes by that there isn't a letter from the editor. We have participated in countless public forums. Um, you saw Chip Northrup and Lou Alstead on the movie, and they've been tireless in their um, volunteer efforts. Um, the demands for zoning ordinances are just growing. Uh, I mean, I cannot tell you how much um, traction we are getting on this issue now. And lastly and most importantly, we're planning major participation in the upcoming elections. We have county elections coming up this November. And um, people who aren't on the right side of this issue are going to at least be hearing from some of these neighborhood groups. In conclusion, and I know you thought the conclusion might never come, I want to emphasize that for me, this is not a liberal versus conservative issue. I actually come from a family with a long history in the Republican Party. My husband is here tonight. His father, my father-in-law, was the chairman of the Republican Party in Hawaii. He ran against Dan Inouye and lost, obviously. Uh, and Dan has stayed in office ever since. So I am very aware of, sensitive to, and indeed supportive of the conservative point of view. But on these issues, we should be united. Because what we are talking about here is stealing from our children's future. We are taking a resource that exists now and wasting it, consuming it, shipping it off to China or wherever. The true patriotic action might be to preserve these resources for our children, or should our country ever need strategic reserves of some of these resources. Let's not just sell them off. And then, I like this thought too. Who will pay for the unfunded mandates? Who will pay for the extra medical expenses that will be incurred by communities inundated with pollutants? Who will pay to clean this water? Who will pay to clean the land? Have you seen what a Superfund site costs to clean? By the time that comes around in 20 or 30 years, do you think the big players are still going to be here? Or do you think they're going to sell out to some company that's capitalized at about $200,000? You know, it's going to be the latter. It's what is the history of our country, frankly, with a lot of exploitation of um, mineral and gas reserves. So we have to be careful. This is not an issue that should pit the liberals against the conservatives. We should all be on the side of our children and our health and the beauty that is our gift. It came to us without our asking and we have a duty to pass it on. Um, the changes that are described in Bradford County are truly transformational. I myself and some of you may have been to Dimmick. It is transformational. You cannot live with this industry as your neighbor. You cannot farm. You can't attend the opera. You can't have a picnic. You can't let your children play in the water. Um, it, is, um, it is something that we need as a community to um, awaken to, and I think we are. Um, and so I'll just leave you with that, that you can take action. And um, thank you very much. I'll leave you with a beautiful vision from Otsego County. Thank you. Jeanette Barth. I'm an economist. I was asked to speak tonight. I want to thank CCARE for hosting this forum. It's a very important topic. And I want to thank Nicole for sharing the five big myths that she shared. I actually think there are two more myths I want to add. Myth number six. The industry, the gas industry, has been claiming that natural gas is a clean fuel. The industry keeps claiming this, and people are believing it. While natural gas may be a cleaner burning fuel, 
when it's examined on a cradle-to-grave basis, natural gas does not, in fact, appear to be a clean fuel. Some of you have probably seen the recent research by the EPA, reported in November, and also research from the Tyndall Center of Climate Change at the University of Manchester in England, released just this past January, and of course the research of Professor Robert Haworth of Cornell University, all of which conclude that when you include extraction and production in the comparison of shale gas to, to oil or to coal, shale gas ends up not being a clean fuel. I started hearing about gas drilling in the Marcellus Shale several years ago. I heard concerns about the environment and public health concerns. I also heard grandiose claims about economic benefits. As I'm an economist, and I've been an economist for a very long time, I decided to read the economic impact studies that are frequently quoted. And this brings me to yet another myth. The industry claims that gas drilling in the Marcellus Shale will bring many jobs and economic prosperity to our region. My heart goes out to any struggling farmers and anybody that's struggling economically in our area, and I know there are a lot, a lot of us out there who are. But sadly, gas drilling may not be the panacea to the economic woes of upstate New York. I've reviewed a lot of the economic impact studies. I think I've actually seen all of them. If I miss any, please email me. I, I'll give you my email address at the end. Many of them are sponsored, funded by gas corporations and by coalitions of gas corporations and other supporters of gas drilling. I'll explain why the conclusions in these studies are probably exaggerated. First, a warning. We've all heard numbers like 100, 200, even 400 jobs created per well. When you hear such numbers quoted, remember, gas workers move from well to well, so these jobs are not necessarily measured in person years. Many of these jobs are short-term and part-time jobs. And many of these workers are imported from other states on a transient, non-permanent basis. Whenever you hear such numbers quoted, please be sure to look at the numbers carefully, seek out the sources, and evaluate any possible bias of the source of the numbers. The studies that claim a positive economic impact tend to be either biased, dated, seriously flawed, or simply inapplicable to our region. Studies not funded by the gas companies have reached different conclusions than those funded by the gas companies. The studies that I've reviewed are from various regions across the United States. In New York, I looked at the draft supplemental generic environmental impact study and also the Broome County study. In Pennsylvania, I looked at two studies out of Penn State and a third one funded by the American Petroleum Institute. Also in the Marcellus Shale, there was a study of West Virginia. In the Fayetteville Shale in Arkansas, there were two studies out of the business school there, funded by Southwestern Energy and some other gas companies. In Texas, I looked at a study by the Perryman Group. And I looked at a study of the Western states by a firm called Headwaters Economics. And there are also a couple of academic studies that I looked at, not funded by the industry, that I'll also mention. First, the SGEIS. It was released by the New York State DEC in 2009. The economic analysis included, included in the SGEIS is from 1988. It's 22 years old. I feel that no responsible decision maker should be relying on an economic analysis that's 22 years old. Next, they use an economic multiplier of 1.4. Economists use the term economic multiplier. It's quite useful as it shows how much output, spending, or employment may result from one dollar of spending by a particular industry in a given region. So in this example, the multiplier of 1.4 means that if the gas industry spends one dollar in the region, it will generate a total earnings of $1.40 in the region. Other industries, perhaps more desirable from an environmental point of view, and may be more sustainable for the region in the longer term, such as possibly agriculture and tourism, 
may have larger economic multipliers. This is something that should be studied in detail. Note that the gas industry is very capital intensive. That means that its employment multiplier would be relatively low. The SGEIS ignores possible declines in other industries that may result from both pollution and a shift to an industrial landscape. These industries include agriculture, tourism, organic farming, winemaking, hunting, fishing, and river recreation. A thorough evaluation would include impact analysis of potential declines in other industries. The SGEIS also ignores other significant costs. For example, it recommends that 150 new tasks be assigned to the DEC, but the cost of staffing these additional tasks are left out of the analysis. The SGEIS itself references several other flawed studies, one of which is the Broome County study. The Broome County study was commissioned by the Broome County Legislature. The Broome County study ignores declines in the other industries that I mentioned, including agriculture. And a major food cooperative in New York City that purchases millions of dollars of New York State produced agricultural products has stated, and I quote, our members will not want the fruit and veggies that come from farms in an industrialized area. And they are concerned about whether the cows they buy were drinking contaminated water and breathing the air foul fouled by numerous enormous trucks that will support the hydrofracking process and also the hydrofracking process itself. The study ignores very relevant and very significant costs. There will be damage to infrastructure, especially roads and bridges. I understand that at least 1,000 large truck trips per well will be required. Be skeptical of the claims by the gas industry that they will pay for the repair of roads and bridges. In the tiny town of Kachectin in Sullivan County, New York, during the construction of the Millennium Pipeline, between one and $1.2 million of damage was caused to their roads, and the pipeline company promised to pay for the repair. In the end, the pipeline company only paid $125,000. The cost of drinking water contamination and land, stream, and air pollution are ignored in the Broome County study. The cost of mitigation is ignored, and so is the cost in terms of health. Again, various contaminants in the fracking fluid and in the flowback fluids are endocrine disruptors and carcinogens. I was interested to learn that some of the wastewater contaminants are directly related to bladder cancer, and bladder cancer is one of the most expensive cancers to treat. That's an economic cost that's not reflected in any of the studies. The study de ignores declines in property values. Supporters of gas drilling say that property values will increase. This is a major unanswered question. Rental rates will probably increase due to an influx of transient workers. Hotel occupancy rates will probably increase. And we've seen this happen, rents and hotel occupancy rates increase in Pennsylvania. The value of large tracts of land may increase, but single family homes and small lots will probably decline in value. Reports indicate that some banks are not giving mortgages for properties with a gas lease or even properties nearby a gas lease. And how do you sell a house if the buyer can't get a mortgage or if the house has contaminated drinking water? Also, some insurance companies are refusing to issue policies on homes with gas wells. It was reported that the Wise County Central Real Estate Appraisal District decreases values of homes by as much as 75% when a gas well sits on the land. Wise County, by the way, is in the Barnett Shale in Texas. Let's look at the economic reality in New York. While I am the first to admit that there are many factors that may distinguish one county from another, I decided to take a look at some of the measures of economic health in historically gas-intensive New York State counties. I looked at actual data for the top 10 gas producing counties in New York State. This is, of course, conventional vertical gas drilling. I looked at the period from 2006 to 2008, and I compared the top 10 gas producing counties to five neighboring counties without gas wells. 
The gas intensive counties are not better off than the non gas drilling counties. The gas intensive counties are not better off when you look at things like the number of families below poverty level, median household income, or unemployment rates. And by the way, I'm not the only economist saying this. Very recently, Cornell professor Susan Christofferson did a very similar analysis for both New York State and for Pennsylvania, and she reached the exact same conclusion. Let's go to Pennsylvania. Here I'm grouping three studies together. They have the same primary author, Timothy Considine. The first two came out of Penn State when he was a professor there. They were both funded by the Marcellus Shale Coalition. It's a coalition of gas companies. The third study was funded by the API, the American Petroleum Institute, another trade association. The author had moved to Penn State moved away from Penn State to the University of Wyoming before the API study came out. All three of these studies are likely biased as they are funded by the industry and the industry provided the data. It appears that the industry has been exaggerating its estimates of gas production expected from shale. Arthur Berman, a petroleum geologist and consultant to the energy sector, has shown that the decline curves for gas extraction in the Barnett Shale and the Fayetteville Shale are much steeper than industry claims and that years of production per well are far fewer. And Deborah Rogers, the financial expert and former member of the advisory committee for the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas, states that based on historical production data, the average Barnett Shale well life is 7.5 years not the 30 to 40 years as originally projected. Also, about 70% of predicted production in horizontal wells has been produced by year five, according to Deborah Rogers' analysis. She says that very few wells will make it to the 15 to 20 year lifespan. She says that actual production data in the Barnett shows no correlation between the initial production in shale wells and ultimately recoverable reserves. The industry projected average reserves to be 2.5 billion cubic feet per well in the Barnett Shale. It's turned out to be only 0.81. Roger says that reserves may be overestimated by a substantial factor, possibly as high as 300%. And the gas companies may have borrowed a huge amount of money based on reserves that they cannot pull out of the ground at a commercially, co commercially viable cost. Nicole mentioned that BHB Billiton, an Australian mining company, huge company, purchased $4.75 billion worth of shale gas as assets from Chesapeake. Chesapeake had to put the Fayetteville shale assets up for, up for sale because they were looking to raise around $5 billion to help them trim a heavy debt load. So Deborah Rogers seems to be correct. She even says that some analysts have gone so far as to liken this to the mortgage-backed securities bubble. So back to the fact that gas production numbers appear to be exaggerated by the industry. If assumptions of levels of gas production and the number of years of production are overly exaggerated and those assumptions are put into an economic model, then it's obvious that the projections coming out of that model such as employment levels, income levels, and tax revenue will also be overly exaggerated. The Penn State studies estimate a supply equation whereby all extraction is explained by only one variable, the price of natural gas at Henry Hub. This equation statistically explains 82% of the variation in gas production. Gas price is very volatile which then means that gas extraction and production is highly volatile. Now, if this supply equation is accurate, and I'm not saying it is or it isn't, I have not estimated that equation, but if it is accurate, it probably doesn't make sense for a region to form a long-term development plan on such a volatile industry. Again, like the studies I mentioned before, the Penn State studies and the API study ignore important economic costs, such as infrastructure damage, water contamination, and other pollution, and declines in other industries. These studies all take a short-term view. 
What happens to the region when all the gas is gone and we may be left with contaminated drinking water, pollution, an industrial landscape, and a population with failing health? The more recent West Virginia study also shares some of these flaws in that they use input-output analysis techniques and they base their data on a survey of the gas companies. I do give them credit for at least listing some of the things that are not reflected in their analysis, both positive and negative. And they even mention the serious environmental risks. The West Virginia study authors also confirm that the natural gas industry is known for hiring out-of-state workers. Input-output analysis is a technique used for most of these economic impact studies. What is input-output analysis? It's also referred to I-O analysis. It's done using a matrix of input-output coefficients, showing how the output of one industry is spread across other industries as inputs. So it is inter-industry analysis. Vital, vital to this type of analysis is an understanding of how the inputs and outputs are linked. And these links are measured by what are called input-output coefficients. Bear with me here, this part's a little boring. Bear with me. The coefficients typically used are provided by the Bureau of Economic Analysis at the U.S. Department of Commerce. And by the way, one of the preeminent scholars and practitioners of input-output analysis was one of my main professors when I was getting my PhD. So I do know a little bit about it. Input-output analysis is a great tool and it's extremely useful in many, many situations. But with all economic models, the practitioner must be very careful and knowledgeable to be sure that the results are realistic and as accurate as possible. So what's wrong with I.O. analysis in this context? First and foremost, it doesn't capture the cost of environmental degradation, damage and wear and tear on roads, health effects and pollution, or negative impacts on other industries such as tourism and agriculture. An input-output model assumes that all populations have identical spending patterns. This exaggerates economic impact tremendously if new workers are transient and non-permanent, which I understand often to be the case with gas drilling workers. Such transient workers send their wages to their families in their home states where it gets spent to improve those economies. Input-output analysis assumes constant return to scale. This would mean that the gas industry would get no volume discounts on supplies. It's probably an unrealistic assumption. Input-output models are, are static in time and they're aspatial. So this means that coefficients don't change over time and aspatial means that transportation costs are not fully reflected. Perhaps the most, concer most important concern in this application of input-output models is the fact that the actual input-output coefficients are not known. One cannot know the true coefficient values in a case where the industry does not already exist in a region such as horizontal drilling and hydrofracking in upstate New York. There are other ways in which this type of analysis could also be inaccurate. The production function is kept constant, so there is no input substitution or changes in proportions of inputs as technology changes over time, and there are no price changes, all unrealistic assumptions. Economic reality in Pennsylvania. A report by the Allegheny Conference on Community Development stated that 70% of Marcellus Shale drilling site workers are from out of state. Just last month, an Oklahoma paper reported that many gas companies are using dormitory-style housing because most workers are from outside the area, spending two weeks on the job and two weeks off. We all know that recently, Chesapeake built exactly such housing in the Marcella Shale region. I ask, why build this type of housing if they're truly committed to training and hiring local residents? I'm sure you've all seen some of the puff pieces in the various papers. The Marcella Shale Coalition, again, a lobbying organization for gas corporations, still quotes the Penn State study and claims that 88,000 jobs were to be created in Pennsylvania in the year 2010 due to Marcella Shale drilling. Publicly available Pennsylvania data show that total job creation in the state was only 65,600. 
Half of these jobs were in education and health and in leisure and hospitality. The grandiose job claims are from data provided by the industry and they are not at all consistent with data from unbiased publicly available sources. I often like to take my data from the U.S. Census County business patterns as it provides unbiased state and county level data at a detailed industry level. Data for 2009 have not even been released, so it takes a while to get this data. So I looked at the most recently available data, which is 2008. The fact is that in 2008, 195 Marcellus Shale gas wells were drilled in the state of Pennsylvania. And in that same year, statewide employment in the oil and gas extraction industry dropped. I'll be watching for the 2009 and 2010 numbers when they're released. I really do hope that these new data will confirm some of the anecdotes of job creation espoused by the industry, and that Pennsylvania will at least see a short-term employment boom, given all the problems they've been having there. And I really hope that most of these jobs will go to local residents. It's good to see that local colleges in Pennsylvania are beginning to offer courses to train local residents. But with regard to the rosy projections for 2011 and beyond, will there be a continuing natural gas boom? In December, the Pittsburgh Tribune Review reported that natural gas exploration companies are reducing operations in the state. Among the companies reducing operations are Chesapeake, Range Resources, Cabot Oil and Gas, and Talisman Energy. So it looks like we won't see much growth, if any, in the natural gas industry in Pennsylvania in 2011, and we don't know beyond that. An interesting aside, I saw a report on a recent meeting of the Bradford County Concerned Citizens Group. At that meeting, the coordinator of the Bradford County Tea Party Patriots called for a reduction in the pace of drilling in Bradford County and two candidates for Bradford County Commissioner support the idea. Current Commissioner Mark Smith said that it would be very, very difficult to convince lawmakers to come up with the money to reduce traffic congestion. It will be very hard to get the money to build a bypass. So it looks like perhaps the gas companies are not paying sufficiently for improved roads in Pennsylvania. Let's go to Texas. Supporters of natural gas drilling in the Marcellus Shale often point to the success of the Barnett Shale play in Texas. I've been developing economic models for a very long time, and I would never submit a report without clearly stating my data sources, describing my model structure, and showing tests of model accuracy. The Perryman study fails on all three of these. It doesn't make clear where the data come from, and it claims that their econometric model is proprietary. I simply cannot trust this study until more information is provided. But even if Texas has experienced a significant positive economic impact, it doesn't mean that New York State will. Comparing the economic impact of gas drilling in the Barnett, in the Barnett Shale to gas drilling in the Marcellus Shale is like comparing apples to oranges. The labor force in Texas has the requisite skill set due to its long history of oil and gas drilling there. Rural counties in upstate New York have to import much of this labor. We already saw that Pennsylvania imports 70% of the labor. The imported labor, again, is transient, temporary, sending most of their income back to families in other states, maybe Texas. Texas has a huge support industry network for the oil and gas industry. It has all the requisite machinery and equipment, much of which is distributed, contracted for, repaired, and serviced in Texas. New York State doesn't have gas company headquarters. They tend to be headquarters, headquartered in other states like Oklahoma and Texas. The Barnett Shale is in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex area. It's a dynamic urban region with all the affected industries ensconced right there. This is very different from rural New York. The Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex may be a good place to use input-output analysis as all the industries are there and have been there for some time. There, one would know the input-output coefficients. Also, Texas has a warm climate, so as landowners become rich, they're likely to stay there. 
In New York State, it's possible that newly rich landowners may decide to move to warmer climates with their newfound wealth. We don't know. So in the end, Texas may derive a greater economic benefit from gas drilling in New York than will New York. By the way, when I said this in a recent talk where there were a lot of Texans in the audience, a number of them claimed, but we're not doing well economically in the Barnett Shale region either. In fact, the Star-Telegram reported that Fort, Fort Worth's budget gap is larger than all other major Texas cities. So much for tax revenue from shale gas development contributing greatly to local government's fiscal position. And interestingly, I saw a report on Monday that the University of North Texas has put together an interdisciplinary group to identify the impacts of the Barnett shale boom on the region. The team includes economist Dr. Terry Clower, who said, the resource won't last, the gas will play out. He also said, because the best production comes in the first month or so of a well's life, operators tend to drill new wells rather than rework old ones, contributing to a proliferation of well sites. He continued to say that now properties in the region are dotted with wells and crisscrossed with pipelines, complicating other uses of land. This could compromise potential future economic development. We can't have a talk on economic impact without going over a few things about economic multipliers. They are quoted frequently, and you should be aware of some generally known facts about economic multipliers. Multipliers are large in more developed areas with industrial diversity. This is certainly true of the Fort Worth area, but not true of the Catskills and the rest of rural New York. Multipliers are large for areas with labor force who have requisite skill sets. Again, this is true of the Fort Worth area, but not rural New York. Multipliers are larger in areas where permanent residents are the workers. This is true in the Fort Worth area, but maybe not in the Marcellus region of upstate New York. And finally, multipliers are larger for labor-intensive industries than for capital-intensive industries. The oil and gas industry is 10 times more capital-intensive than the average American industry. A nonprofit firm out west called Headwaters Economics did an informative study that was not funded by the gas companies. I've taken some criticism for claiming that the firm is independent. To be very clear, what I'm saying is that this firm is independent of the gas industry. I contacted Headwaters and was told, and I have it in writing, that their largest funders are the Bureau of Land Management and the U.S. Forest Service. Some people have claimed that this study is biased because they claim it's also funded by the, K, the V. Kahn Rasmussen Foundation, a foundation whose stated mission is, quote, to support the transition to an environmentally resilient, stable, and sustainable world. Whatever their mission, I was told by Headwaters Economics, also in writing, that while they do get some funding from the Rasmussen Foundation, the Rasmussen Foundation funds none of their energy work. The results of the Headwaters study, again, not funded by the gas corporations, um, are interesting. They're very different from the results from the gas-funded studies. The study analyzed 23 counties out west to compare the economic health of counties that focused on fossil fuel extraction as a strategy for economic development. It compared it to neighboring counties that did not. It concluded that counties that were not focused on fossil fuel extraction experienced higher growth rates, more diverse economies, better educated populations, a smaller gap between high and low income households, and more retirement and investment income. While I'm on the subject of impact in Western states, there have been some knowledgeable people also speaking about community impacts. For example, Jill Morrison of the Powder River Basin Resource Council in Wyoming reported that there have been 10% to 15% increases in the crime rates in the counties in Wyoming where there have been gas booms. She also said that they had terrible drug problems, particularly with methamphetamines coming into the counties with gas booms. 
These counties have had to increase the size of their jails. These are additional economic costs to communities. You can see her talk um, online um, at the Oil and Gas Summit in Pittsburgh. Closer to home in Pennsylvania, in August of 2010, the Penn State Cooperative Extension quoted Bradford County Commissioner Mark Smith. He said, the things people don't understand are the impacts on volunteer fire departments, social services, drug and alcohol prevention, jails, and state police. He said that 60 to 70 out-of-state gas drilling workers had gone through his county's jail system and that a few extra inmates each month added a huge taxpayer expense to a small institution. Another study, an academic study published in 2002, reviewed 301 quantitative analyses in order to determine the economic implications for mining in non-metropolitan regions. It concluded that unemployment and poverty worsened in mining counties in non-metropolitan regions. It found that the highest levels of long-term poverty are in places where there was once a thriving extractive industry. Another study that I referred to earlier is being done by Dr. Susan Christofferson at Cornell, and her preliminary comments support this conclusion as well. Her research is not funded by the gas industry. It's funded by the Heinz Foundation and the Park Foundation. She says that the gas industry is a speculative, high-risk, short-term industry, and that the shale play is likely to create a short-term boom followed by a long-term bust. Another study of the natural gas industry in New Mexico, done in 2005 by Professor Power at the University of Montana, has made a number of conclusions that support the conclusions that the other independent researchers have made. Again, this study was not funded by the gas industry. Powers concluded that because natural gas development is land, capital, and technology intensive, intensive it makes limited use of human labor, thereby providing limited employment and pay opportunities. This is one of the reasons it can create such great value for the corporations. Because natural gas development requires specialized skilled workers who by necessity move to wherever new gas fields are under development, many of the development jobs will not be available to local residents. He further concludes that the spillover or multiplier impacts on the local economy associated with natural gas development are very limited for several reasons. First, much of the natural gas is shipped out of the local economy unprocessed. Second, most of the equipment, tools, and materials are specialized and must be imported into the local area from distant trade centers. And third, because of the mobile workforce, much of the payroll leaves the local economy flowing to the workers' home bases. And finally, Professor Power concludes that across the nation, local economies that rely heavily on mineral development face instability and downward cycles of boom and bust. So again, boom and bust is what to expect. Note that not only economists and environmental activists are saying this about the economic impact, even investment analysts say that the oil and gas business has a record of booms and busts. Economic development experts all know that this is not a desirable situation for a community. We all know that some gas companies and perhaps a few landowners may be very happy to have just a short-term bust, a short-term boom followed by a long-term bust in order to take the money and run. Nobody disagrees that there will be short-term jobs created, including jobs on drilling sites and ancillary jobs such as truck drivers, welders, road workers, hotel and restaurant workers. The questions are, how many are long-term, full-time jobs? How many are good jobs? How many of these jobs will be filled by local residents? How long will these jobs last? I've pointed out deficiencies in the industry-funded studies, and I've shown that independent studies have reached vastly different conclusions. There are deficiencies in most studies. All the more reason to be sure that the best possible unbiased study is done that can be respected by all prior to rushing into gas drilling. If our legislators and other decision makers are truly concerned about our health, our environment, and our community's long-term economic condition, 
They should pay attention to the conclusions of independent researchers based on sound methodology and data, not researchers hired by the gas companies, and certainly not to selected anecdotal clips of anticipated jobs cited by representatives of the gas industry. Again, independent, unbiased research indicates that there will be a long-term bust and we may very well end up worse off than we are now. I've received various comments asking about the wealth effect, in this case referring to the lease payments and royalties that will come into the region. Some landowners have claimed that this alone will bring economic prosperity to the region. This raises other unanswered questions. Yes, again, some landowners may benefit, but we don't know enough about how those windfalls will be spent to know if it will benefit the region. Will the windfalls be spent locally? We know that about 40% will go to income taxes, and most of that goes to the federal government. A significant portion may be invested in stocks and bonds. We don't know. Will most of it be spent on improving farms here? That would be great, but we don't know. Will the money stay here? We just don't know. Penn State is doing a study of exactly this now, so the answers are not known at this time. And note that I'm not the only economist raising these questions. Other economists, not notably Professor Susan Christofferson, who I mentioned before, and Professor Timothy Kelsey of Penn State, have both raised the same issue. Professor Kelsey was recently quoted to have said, the more money that stays local, the more impact there is on the economy. The challenge is how do we make sure the dollars stay local? He also asked, if you build for the boom, how do you handle building for the bust? More unanswered questions. How do you plan up front for a drop in income and a bust later on? I think it's really interesting, as Nicole pointed out, that many local existing businesses are opposed to fracking. It was interesting to see that the Cooperstown Chamber of Commerce took a formal position against both vertical and horizontal fracking, recognizing that it would not be good for existing businesses. Also, Omegan Brewery has been joined by at least 200 businesses in, op in opposing hydrofracking in the Marcellus Shale. So, the only parties likely to benefit in the long run are the gas companies and a few lucky landowners. The gas companies have very deep pockets, much deeper than the organizations who work to protect the environment and public health. Estimated investment by gas companies in the Marcellus Shale region is in the billions of dollars. How much do you think they are prepared to spend to protect their investment? How much are they willing to spend on PR to distort the facts and sponsoring one-sided studies and helping elect politicians who see it their way? The gas industry has spent large amounts on lobbying and political contributions. Please remember that the gas companies are also spending a lot of money on economic analyses and PR statements to convince all of us that the environmental risks are worth taking. It's interesting to me that some of the landowners who have been critical of my speaking out on this topic will not trust the gas companies when it comes to their own leases. They don't believe everything the landman says when he, they come to his house. They hire attorneys and they join coalitions to negotiate. Why in the world would these same people believe everything the gas industry says about environmental and health impacts and regional economic benefits? One of the areas in which the gas companies are lobbying has to do with taxes. Federal tax treatment of the oil and gas industry encourages leasing, exploration, and drilling, whether or not they produce gas. This could ruin our landscape and contaminate our water, land, and air, and still not produce much gas. For example, the government generally allows a deduction for only a limited amount of losses from passive activities such as leasing land. Oil and gas companies are exempt. They're allowed to take a full deduction of these costs. Another example, the oil and gas industry companies may deduct in the first year, in the very first year, drilling expenses, all drilling expenses, including fracking fluids. Most other industries must recover their costs over the life of the investment. 
Industry lobbyists talked the U.S. Senate out of removing subsidies in the past, and it was in part on the basis of potential job loss. Alan Kruger, the chief economist and assistant secretary for economic policy at the Treasury Department, said the oil and gas industry is about 10 times more capital intensive than the U.S. economy as a whole, and that encouraging oil and gas production is not an effective strategy for creating jobs. One last thing on taxes and the lobbying effort of the industry, the proposed severance tax in Pennsylvania. During the intense talks about the imposition of a severance tax in Pennsylvania, the industry was pushing hard for Pennsylvania to exempt them from paying it for the first two or three years, or at least setting a much lower rate for the early years of gas production for each well. As I mentioned earlier, industry estimates of longevity of wells may be far exaggerated, and industry knows very well that the most productive, the most production will be in the first years of a well's existence, the years, precise years in which they are asking for an exemption. Here are some of my conclusions. The economic impact studies that conclude a positive economic impact ignore important and probably statistically significant costs. These economic impact studies have been funded primarily by industry. The methodology used is often inappropriate for a thorough evaluation of the industry in this region. The economic impact may not be worth the risk of the potentially severe and in some cases irreversible consequences in the form of health, environmental, and infrastructure degradation. Gas drilling in the Marcellus Shale is likely to result in a short-term boom followed by a long-term bust. Beware, gas drilling in the Marcellus Shale may result in a net negative economic impact for New York State. We, and especially our leaders and decision makers, should insist on a comprehensive, unbiased, peer-reviewed economic impact study based on published data and appropriate models to ensure that these questions are answered in a way that everyone, everyone can respect. We're lucky in New York that we have an opportunity to wait and watch what happens in our neighboring state of Pennsylvania over the longer term before we take any risks. The gas will not go anywhere while we wait, watch, research, and figure out how to extract the resource safely and in a way that would benefit everybody in the region. We have to plan carefully and move slowly in light of the potentially negative long-term implications. Here's my email address. Feel free to contact me. Thank you. <laughs>